So when I was about 10 years old, my mum gave me a book called Look Before You Leap. Although I didn't read the book because I actually couldn't sit still that long, the message was really clear. She wanted me to slow down and to stop being so impulsive. Yep, from the moment I was born, I was constantly on the move, keen to explore the world around me. By the time I was two years and three months old, I was actually a seasoned escape artist. Despite my dad fixing a piece of slippery masonite onto our gate in the hope that I would not be able to get a foothold, I managed to climb over the gate, escape and walk five blocks to the local store because I liked the lady and she gave me lollies. I was also a really creative, imaginative and inquisitive child and I loved getting a reaction, especially from my sister. And as you can see, I put this, this um, poor girl through hell. I also loved playing with water so much that my parents had to remove the tap handles of all the inside taps to stop me from flooding the place. In this photo, Mum had managed to stop me talking loudly and incessantly enough to Santa about what I wanted for Christmas, just long enough for the photographer to take my photo and move me on. You see, I really was a bundle of unbridled enthusiasm. I talked a million miles an hour, asked a million questions, and I had an answer for everything. But underneath it all, I was a very sensitive and emotional child, and I cared a great deal about others. I also was a child who wanted to be liked, who really wanted to do the right thing. I thrived on praise and positive attention. But when my interests were sparked, I was off chasing rainbows and I lost sight of everything. During this time, I was actually really happy. I was lost in the moment in a world of my own, totally oblivious to societal expectations, as well as how my behaviour was affecting others. Joyful and carefree until I was in trouble. Then I was a sad child, a child in pain, debilitating, crippling pain that would consume me. Pain that would surge through my body and flood my senses. It would make my chest tighten, I'd get a lump in my throat and the tears would well in my eyes. I remember always trying so darn hard to prevent this pain, but due to my self-regulation challenges, it would always sneak up on me just when I was being me. Even as I grew older, that god-awful pain seemed to follow me as I seemed to always find myself on the receiving end of criticism, judgment and rejection, brought about by the fact that no matter how much I tried, I couldn't always control my focus and attention, I didn't have a pause button, I made decisions on a whim and I couldn't always filter the words that came out of my mouth and my memory regularly failed me. Not surprisingly, the knowledge that I had let myself and others down yet again, as well as the frequent criticism, anger and rejection I experienced despite my best efforts, had a negative effect on my self-esteem and self-worth. And over time, I started to believe that there was something wrong with me, that I was bad, that I was stupid, that I was broken, for I was the naughty child. But although my mum struggled with me and often felt like she was banging her head against a brick wall, she also loved me, hence why she was hoping to point out that if I could just slow down and start to look before I leap, things might get easier. The problem was, I couldn't. Not at 10 years old, not at 20 either, or at 30, no matter how many times she asked me to. And at 47 years of age, I found out why. For at 47 years of age, I was diagnosed with ADHD, the disorder that robs individuals of the ability to pause and willfully exert self-control, and sadly, the disorder that many people in our community do not believe exists. The one surrounded by stigma and false assertions that kids with ADHD are just naughty and all their problems could be solved with a quick sweep after the, you know, under the ear. And that, you know those adults with that disorder? That's just an excuse. They're really, really lazy, stupid, rude, etc. However, as you all know, this is not true. The copious studies have shown that the brains of individuals with ADHD differ from neurotypical individuals. And because of this, we do not develop the executive control at the same time as our peers or to the same degree. I know you all work with individuals with ADHD and you care greatly about us, but have you ever stopped and put yourself in the shoes of someone with the disorder and imagined what it would like to experience these challenges? With your permission, I'd like you to go there. Imagine feeling like you have little control over your brain, 
that sometimes it refuses to work and other times it absolutely refuses to stop working. Therefore, you can't make your brain concentrate and do things that it seems boring or tedious despite there being really <coughs> bad negative consequences. However, your brain goes full steam ahead like a runaway train without any brakes and gets hyper-focused on something that piques its interest until it crashes. Imagine struggling to filter external noise, sights and sounds for relevance as everything appears to be just as loud and of equal importance to you, whilst at the same time being constantly bombarded by your thoughts, many of which are totally irrelevant to the task at hand and they take you off track, even when you're speaking to your friends. Your noisy thoughts also make it hard for you to fall asleep. Yep, sometimes I wish my brain would just shut up. Imagine not always being able to filter your words that come out of your mouth and as a result you find yourself interrupting others, blurting out comments in an appropriate manner and having foot in mouth. Just like the time when I told a lady in my mother's group that I felt like a dirty old car salesman when I was trying to sell my services when I worked as a health coach. I had a picture of Danny DeVito in my head, you know from the movie Matilda, you know selling cars. Unfortunately her husband sold cars for a living. Actually, my dad did too, but I hadn't even crossed my mind. Imagine trying to remember people's names and relevant information about them so you can engage in conversation, but your brain refuses to give you the information you need in the moment. When this happens, you know that you're coming across as being socially inadequate and being perceived as weird. Whilst on the inside, your anxiety takes over and you are full of embarrassment and shame. You want so much to connect, but your brain is absolutely blank. And imagine being so highly emotionally sensitive and feeling your emotions so intensely that they overwhelm you and completely hijack you. That even when you can rationalise what's happened and you're trying so hard to self-soothe and remain calm, that your emotions actually have a mind of your own and they take over, you are at their mercy. Your emotional responses also appear really over the top to others, hence why mum always called me the drama queen. And lastly, imagine what the effect of all these experiences would have on your mental health, your self-esteem and your self-worth. Along with being constantly criticised in trouble for not being able to look before you leap, always told to try harder, to sit still, to focus, even though you're trying your darn hardest and failing to achieve your goals because of the way that your brain is wired, even as an adult. This is the effect it had on me. I grew up feeling shamed, inadequate, flawed and broken. Over time, as a result, I developed anxiety and depression as well as binge eating disorder and I became morbidly obese. And I started to medicate with alcohol. I used to drink um, port out of a wine glass to numb the crippling self-doubt and the pain I felt inside. Even when I started to get these things under control and began to achieve some of my goals, like becoming a wound care stomal therapy nurse or running a whole hospital overnight on my own, my ADHD traits negative the effect of me still in so many ways. And as a result, I found myself into my mid-40s, regularly drowning in that god-awful black hole and wondering, will I ever be able to get out of here? Thankfully, I don't go there anymore. For me, even now, I have my ADHD challenges. I no longer feel like I'm inadequate or that I'm broken. And I do not rely on destructive crutches to help navigate life. Instead, I've learnt to accept myself fully and to love myself unconditionally, warts and all. Not in an I'm too big for my boots kind of way, because that's not love, that's fear. You know, I accept myself completely. I take full responsibility for myself and my actions. And I treat myself as my own best friend kind of way and I feel like I'm thriving, for I love my life and I love the people in it. For I've learnt to embrace my strengths and put in place tools and strategies that help me to manage my challenges and negotiate life more successfully. These include taking stimulant medication and using externalised reminders to help me look before I leap that work approximately 95% of the time. And I've learnt to speak up for myself and to ask for the understanding and assistance I need from people who matter the most in my life. That's not to say that my ADHD no longer challenges me. It does on a daily basis and probably always will. My son also has ADHD, so he challenges me as well. However, 
I'm more at peace with myself and my journey now, and I choose to view my challenges as opportunities to learn and grow, and if that's not possible, another opportunity for self-acceptance. So in closing, I want to share with you some things I've learned since I was diagnosed. Firstly, I've come to accept that no matter how much medication I take or how many strategies I put in place, I am never going to be neurotypical, and that's okay. Nor will most children or adults with ADHD. And for this reason, it is absolutely vital that part of the story changes and that we start to focus on also fostering self-awareness, self-acceptance and self-compassion in individuals with ADHD. Let me explain this further. Let's say for argument's sake, this is the typical range of executive function capacity of a neurotypical individual. Now, I know that not everyone fits in there to perfect degree, but just for argument's sake. When you have ADHD, we tend to develop about 70% of the executive function capacity of neurotypical individuals. And sometimes we don't really develop that really well because when you're not paying attention, you don't implicitly learn things like everyone else does. You need a lot of explicit teaching. Then we put in place strategies like medication and learning things to try and help bridge the gap. But the truth of the matter is, there will always be a gap. And if we don't put self-compassion in that place, we will never, ever be happy. If you have ADHD and you aim for perfection or to be neurotypical, you will always fall short and therefore you will beat yourself up constantly. Mistakes are inevitable when you've got ADHD as medication and strategies are never infallible. Additionally, no one can be happy trying to be something that they're not. Inner peace and contentment requires acceptance of one's authentic self. It requires feeling good about yourself, being your own best friend, cheering yourself on and catching yourself when you fall. It requires setting your own goals, navigating life on your terms, using a roadmap that's designed for you. It's also important to remember that if parents, teachers and the clinicians are trying to fix a child with ADHD, to eradicate all their symptoms, to control their behaviour or to make them neurotypical, they will permanently be frustrated and disappointed. Worse still, they will inevitably give the child the message that there is something wrong with them and that they're not good enough. For without re realising, they will teach the child to place unrealistic expectations of themselves. And as a result, they will go on to live their life comparing themselves to others, constantly feeling like they're failing, beating themselves up, and possibly developing anxiety and depression, just like I did. When you have unrealistic expectations of children with ADHD and do not understand the disorder on a deep level, you also run the risk of resorting to punitive punishment as a means of an attempt to teach the child a lesson or to control their behaviour. But you cannot punish the ADHD out of a child. In fact, punishing a child for behaviour that's a sign or a symptom of their developmental delay and lagging executive function skills will only crush their self-esteem foster shame and exacerbate their challenges and more than likely help them develop oppositional and defiant behaviour. Now please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that ADHD should be considered an excuse or that we should drop all our expectations on children with the disorder. We still need to ensure that children with ADHD develop in a healthy manner, that they can learn and achieve success academically and behave in socially appropriate manner. It's just the end goal and the way that we get there needs to change. And to be clear, despite and with due respect what the medical literature says, the end goal is not symptom control or behaviour management. The end goal should be raising self-aware and well-adjusted individuals with ADHD who understand their disorder, accept themselves fully, individuals that have learned to harness their strengths and manage their challenges to their best ability so they can navigate social situations, achieve their goals on their terms and contribute to society in meaningful ways, who despite their ADHD try their darndest to succeed but lovingly and compassionately catch themselves when they fall because inevitably they will. This end goal requires much more than medication and parenting interventions. It requires that we ensure that the expectations placed on children with ADHD are realistic according to their executive function age, not their peer age, 
or that we put in place scaffolding that helps bridge to the gap between their lagging skills and executive function delay in order to keep them safe, to help them succeed and to help them feel good about themselves. We also need to, at a very early age, start gently fostering in them self-awareness, self-acceptance and self-compassion, <coughs> as well as the knowledge and skills that they will need to one day independently manage their disorder, negotiate life successfully and thrive, all while maintaining their self-esteem. Secondly, I have learnt that for my son and for myself, medication is an absolute godsend. It enables us to be our true selves, to look before we leap, to connect and to honour with our authentic selves and our personal goals and values. I now understand that I am wired for thought action, thoughts coming out of my mouth. Pausing is actually not an option available to me when I'm lost in the moment or just being me, nor is it something I can learn to do. Maturity helped a little, but nothing I've ever tried, including altering my diet, exercising, years and years of mindfulness and meditation, ever gave me a stopgap that medication did. In fact, when I first took medication, I turned to my partner and I said, what is that? It was like this space opened up that had never been there before, a space where I could stop, think and make a willful decision for the first time in my life of how I would respond. I think it's also important for me to share that although this space was actually filled with possibility, the self-awareness around why I had struggled so much in my life in this space it afforded me was very, very painful to process. For a good six months, I found myself doubting myself at every turn. I became very self-conscious, extremely anxious and I would, that I would make a mistake and I withdrew from my friends and family. I realised that I didn't always know how to act or what to say because I'd never learnt. My brain still didn't give me the information I needed in the moment and that my intention was still so interest driven or dopamine driven that I struggled to always see the big picture. It took some time for me to adjust and to find peace in this space that medication has given me. I think it's also important to share that medication does not take all my ADHD challenges away. The ability to pause is still reduced if I'm anxious or I'm extremely passionate, has little effect on my working memory or my memory in general, which is absolutely shot. And if I'm uninterested, bored or overwhelmed, it's still extremely hard to make myself do something. It also doesn't teach me skills, but it does help me to remember to use the skills that I've put in place. I've also learnt how important interest is, like I just managed. And I want to give you an example to highlight just how important it is. From the day one when I became a registered nurse and stepped out onto the floor, I wanted to become a stomal therapy wound care consultant. When I finally got my dream job, in typical hyper-focused man uh, manner, I threw myself into it and learned everything I could. I became like a walking encyclopedia of wounds, an expert in my field and well respected by all the doctors and nurses I worked with. However, about five years into the job, when my son started to first have struggles and I started to get a little bit bored, when I was asked to review a wound that I hadn't seen for like, say, three to four months, not a wound I'd see every day, but one I hadn't seen three to four months, I would go in, in, like, to see somebody and I would know, I knew what that wound was and how to manage it but I couldn't get it out of my brain. It was like it was no longer available or accessible to me, that it had been locked in a vault. I didn't know I had ADHD at the time and I went to my GP convinced that I was developing Alzheimer's disease. Even with medication, interest remains vital. It's near impossible for a child or adult with ADHD to do something they're not interested in and boredom remains intolerable. It is like something is eating you alive for the inside and it feels like depression. This highlights how important it is of keeping our classroom and educational activities interesting, as well as the need to make sure that adults with ADHD are helped to develop the self-awareness and that deep-seated reason why they need to do something or want to do something. They're trying to do something that they think they should, not because they really want to, they're going to find it absolutely impossible. Lastly, I've learnt that the insight and understanding that academics and clinicians can gain from adults with ADHD who have both lived experience and clinical backgrounds is absolutely invaluable and rarely taken advantage of. There is so much of the picture that is actually missing from the literature. 
so much more that you know, I actually don't have time to tell you all about it. But if you want to improve the lives of individuals with ADHD, you really do need our insight. So please include us in the conversation and make use of us. So in conclusion, please remember that it's much, much easier to build up a child with ADHD than it is to repair a broken adult. And everyone deserves to thrive, even those who can't look before they leap and were labelled the naughty child. Thank you.